Public Access Television is not responsible for program content. This program is produced by Anchored in Faith Gospel Church of Oxford, Iowa. Reverend Linda Hahn, Senior Pastor. The latest release of our full-length cable TV telecasts are now prominently posted each week, beginning Sunday evenings on YouTube. YouTube.com slash Anchored in Faith. Search for Anchored in Faith, all one word, in the search box for smart TVs and Roku TV viewing. talking about, well, just before service, about things that churches do to get people to come to church. And um, talk about car raffles and bus ministries and, and just anything to get people to come in and sit. And what do they do when they get there? What do they hear? You know, I mean, what, sure, okay, so you're in church. You know, I was in church before I was saved. I'd go to church now and again. And, uh, well, what do you do when you get there? Well, you know, the church is supposed to be a supernatural organization. That's what That's it's right. supposed to be. It's not just a building, you know. The building, the, the New Testament never talks about the church as a building. When it says church, it means a group of people. Congregation coming together to worship Jesus and to exercise their spiritual gifts. Everybody has a spiritual gift. And a lot of people in church never get taught. Of course, they never get taught anything very much, but they don't understand that when God saves you, you have a place in the body, a supernatural place that you're supposed to function. Maybe you're up here as a pastor. Maybe you're an intercessor. Maybe you're a prophet. Maybe you're, uh, you know, you have the gift of word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits. Those are all gifts. And so I was, I thought, well, maybe we better should just go and do a little basic stuff. Um, if you look at 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about spiritual gifts. And there's 12 of them. You know, and I've heard pastors, preachers talk about uh, people having gifts, you know, and they say, well, so-and-so's got a gift of music. Well, that's fine, but that's not a spiritual gift. That's right. <laughs> a lot of people are musically talented, but that's not a spiritual gift. That's right. You know, so-and-so's, uh, you know, got a good business mind, you know. Well, that's fine, but that's not a spiritual gift. And, of course, a lot of churches have replaced what the Bible says with their own interpretation. So, so now prophecy becomes, well, he's a good preacher. He can get up and, and, and do a good sermon. Or, you know, the gift of uh, healing, well, that's been replaced by going to the doctor. See, the church doesn't have to do that anymore because we have doctors and hospitals, and they didn't have that in the New Testament. And, you know, in fact, in Israel, there were no doctors. Did you know that? There were no doctors in Israel because God said, I'll be your doctor. He said, I'll be your physician. And they, uh, well, I guess, can I say this without getting in trouble? There's a lot of occultism in the medical profession. profession. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of what goes by the name of medical science has come out of occult practices. Now, I'm not saying your doctor's a witch. I didn't say that. Don't go out here and say that's what I said. I didn't say that. But things like acupuncture, which has come into the church, reflexology, I'm not the church, but into medicine, 
a lot of these things, if you study them out and you find out where they came from, uh, you understand that these are occult practice. I mean, acupuncture is a Chinese occult practice. That's what it is, you know? And so uh, anyway, uh, let's get back to what I was gonna say. The, what we need to realize is that we all have, when we come together, we need to function supernaturally with our gift. And you need to spend some time with God. Read uh, Corinthians, 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and it'll tell you what the gifts are. Um, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, gift of faith, healing, working of miracles, all those are gifts that are supposed to be functioning in the church when we come together. And, you know, we just spend a lot of time waiting for somebody else to do something that we ought to be doing. Amen. So that's kind of, I'll, I'll shut up. But, uh, you know, beginning of the new year, we need to really look at ourselves and say, hey, am I going to be the same this year as I was last year? Am I going to be more, am I going to, you know, we talk about being closer to God and being used of God. Do we really mean it? Do we really mean it? Or are we just waiting for somebody else to show us the way when God will show us the way? He'll show you what your gift is if you spend some time with him. And so, again, I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 prayerfully and ask the Lord, what's my gift? Because you've got one. It's there. And it's not putting a basketball through a hoop. And it's not uh, anything like that. It's one of these gifts that are here. And so when we come together, we need to be functioning because we are a body. We're not an organization. We're a body, just like a body with organs and parts. They all have to work together or you're not going to do very well. So with that, let's begin our service and praise the Lord. To be ignorant is to be unaware. And, and, and what Doug was talking about there in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant, my brethren, of supernatural gifts. That's what he says. I don't want you to be unaware. Well, one thing is to be unaware. In other words, you've never been taught. And there's an awful lot of people that just ain't never been taught because they, they, they live in a church that just don't teach. They, they don't believe nothing, so they don't teach nothing. But once you've been taught, and then you're willingly ignorant, as God said to Ezekiel, get the blood off your head, put it on theirs. Amen? You're so precious, Jesus. You have always been there in a time of my need, Lord God. You've never failed me, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God. And I can trust in you, Lord God, to lead and direct me in the way you want. Hallelujah. As I surrender my life to you, Lord God. I surrender my will to you, Lord God. That should be our prayer this morning. Surrender your will to him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We had a strong discussion in Sunday school this morning. Hallelujah. People wanted to know some things, and I taught them some things. We had a whole lot of talk about hell. If there's anyone in the house this morning that's not sure of your eternal destination, this altar is open. The Bible says to work out with fear and trembling your own salvation. If you need to settle it once and for all this morning, once and for all, just come up here and kneel down and 
Talk with Jesus and he'll lift your burden. You've been shackled with a heavy burden. A lot of stuff laid on a lot of shoulders. There might be a whole lot of us need to be at this altar laying down a burden. Hallelujah. So we got a call from West Virginia and prayed for this woman. Hallelujah. And while we were at prayer meeting uh, Tuesday night, and we're prayer meeting Tuesday night, and uh, we got a call from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and it's really something that if somebody, and she's in church, this woman in prayer uh, down there, if they feel led to call clear up here to Iowa and pay the long distance fee so that they can have somebody pray with them about their need, clear down there, Amen. And I talked to her. She's hooked up in church. But you know, I'm easier to get a hold of than her pastor. He says, yeah, I, you mean I got the pastor that there's preaching? I said, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Most of you know John Wayne as an actor. Or you, you may not know what happened to him before he died. This is a true story. Robert Schuler, teenage daughter, Cindy, was in a motorcycle accident and had to have her leg amputated. John Wayne was a big fan of Robert Schuler. He heard Dr. Schuler say on one of his programs that his daughter had had an accident and had to have her leg amputated. He wrote her a note saying, Dear Cindy, sorry to hear about your accident. Hope you'll be all right. Signed, John Wayne. The note was delivered to her, and she decided to, she wanted to write him. She wrote, Dear Mr. Wayne, I got your note. Thanks for writing to me. I like you very much. I am going to be all right because Jesus is going to help me. Mr. Wayne, do you know Jesus? I sure hope you know Jesus. Mr. Wayne, because I cannot imagine heaven being complete without John Wayne being there. I hope if you don't know Jesus, that you will give your heart to Jesus right now. See you in heaven. Signed, Cindy. She had just put the letter in an envelope and sealed it and written across the front of it, John Wayne. When a visitor came into her room to see her, he asked her what she was doing. She replied, I just wrote a letter to John Wayne, but I don't know how to get it to him. He said, that's funny. I'm going to have dinner with John Wayne tonight at the Newport Club at Newport Beach. Give it to me and I will give it to him. She gave him the letter and he put it in his pocket. There was 12 of them that night sitting around the table for dinner. They were laughing and cutting up when the guy happened to reach into his pocket and felt the letter. He remembered. John Wayne was seated at the end of the table. He took the letter out and said, Hey, Duke, I was in Schuler's daughter's hospital room today, and she wrote you a letter. She wanted me to give it to you. Here it is. They passed it down to John Wayne, and he opened it. They kept on laughing and cutting up when someone happened to look down at him. He was crying. One of them said, hey, Duke, what's the matter? He said, I want to read you this letter. He read the letter. Then he began to weep. He folded it, put it in his pocket, pointed to the man who delivered it to him and said, you go tell that little girl that right now in this restaurant, right now, John Wayne gave his heart to Jesus Christ, and I will see her in heaven. Three weeks later, John Wayne died. You never know how your witness to another will affect their eternity. Be a witness for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. You never know. You never know. Um... You know, just, we were um, up Waterloo last, yesterday, and we went out to eat, and this uh, 
gentleman and lady came in and sat down and and uh, she, I think it was their first date. <laughs> I think they met at church. Wait, I get we was kind of eavesdropping on them a little bit. And she says, uh, "Do you mind if we pray over our meal?" He said, "No." So uh, it was nice seeing someone else. We always pray when we go out. But it was nice seeing someone else bow their head in a restaurant and prayed. And uh, I, when I got up to leave, I, I told her, I said, it was really uh, nice of you. Someone else out here, Christian, praying. You know, it's nice to see. That's a witness. That's a witness. When you even go out and, and, and pray, that is a witness that, you know, you are Jesus Christ's child. We discussed a little bit how that the angels that fell came and took of women as they chose. We discussed that in Sunday school this morning. Most people don't want to teach this stuff. Nobody wants to teach anything supernatural. Everything, you want people to be able to understand it in the natural, so they desupernaturalize the Bible and everything is... Everything just becomes nothing. Everything becomes nothing and explains away everything. The truth of the matter is that the Nephilim, nep, Nephilim, did I get that right, Bunny? Nephilim. Well, Nephilim, Nephilim. I used to say Nephilim or something. I don't know. Nephilim, Nephilim were on the earth, the fallen ones, and they defiled the bloodline. We, we did a whole bunch. Bunch of talk this morning just amazed people in Sunday school. You got you learned something you never learned before, you won't learn anywhere else about how God established his people, how he used selective breeding. That's what he did. Selective breeding. It sounds weird, but that's what he did. Do you know what the oh Lord? Yeah. <laughs> Let's get it. You know what the devil tried to do? The opposite, the same thing. Who was the last time to give it a good shot? The good shot at doing selective breeding, Hitler. He's going to eliminate the chosen seed and make his own chosen seed. Boy, you, you know, you just don't even, I mean, you just don't want to mention this stuff the way I do, but it's true. Amen? See, Hitler was going to wipe out the remnant of the Hebrew people, the ones that he knew were Hebrew, the, the Jews, what the remnant, the only one that was still recognized and commonly known who they were, and he's going to replace them with his own. That's exactly what the devil there. You're going to replace God's people with his own hybrids. But upon the face of the earth, God had decided that he would just like to wipe everybody out because the whole bunch is defiled. I'm not sure he don't look down and feel that way today. I'm, I mean, it, it looks pretty bleak out there. Amen? Even inside what's supposed to be the church, corruption just a... Holiness is frowned upon if in the church. Can you believe that? Holiness is frowned upon if in the church. We won't hear that holiness stuff. Well, I don't, Sister Fran said under some teaching that just said, I don't know what some of the stuff that they taught her, what that, some stuff she's telling me this morning. It's just unbelievable. Unbelievable how sin isn't sin anymore. Yeah. So, if it's not sin anymore, let's go for it. Amen. And he says, I'm going to bring uh, Genesis 6, 13. This is the word of God, and I know that it's true. Amen? Amen. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence. Do them, and behold, I will destroy them from the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, rooms, Shalt thou make it in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without, sealed with tar, it says. This is the fashion which thou wilt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shall take to the ark, and a cubit shall make thou finish it above, and the door in the ark shall set in the side thereof, and with the lower, the second, the third stairs shall make it. It's a great big boat. Amen. But it, and behold it. I, even I, do bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy all flesh 
whence is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is the earth shall die. He's going to flood the entire earth. <sighs> and all flesh shall die. For the heart of man is continually evil. And the only one he sees that's not defiled. And I'm not saying that this is a perfect man that's not sin. But his bloodline is not defiled. The only one perfect on the earth is Noah. He's going to destroy the whole thing. God made it. He can destroy it. Amen. Now, we're going to talk about faith a little bit this morning. Stand here to preach this morning it takes faith. Amen. Faith knowing that, that God is who he says he is. Noah had to have some faith. He had to have some faith. Noah is not surrounded by a bunch of believing people. There ain't no believers there, amen? amen. He's the only one. Amen. And then God has the audacity to come up and say to him, make an ark, and I'm going to make it rain, and I'm going to open up the aquifers of the earth, and I'm going to cause water to come from everywhere. Now, my Bible tells me that at that time, before the flood, that the earth was watered by a mist that came out of the earth. It hadn't rained. You said, God? You said rain? What's rain? <laughs> you got to see what kind of faith that this called, elect, ordained, and chosen vessel of God had yeah, rain. I suppose that we don't have all the words that God spoke to Noah in the Bible. I suppose that apparently God had to explain to him what rain was. I'm going to make water fall out of the sky. Okay, God. It would... Just how would you react if God told you something was going to happen that you'd never seen happen before? How much faith would you show? How called, elect, chosen, and ordained are you? What could he say? I'm going to make tons of karma calling and fire out of the sky so you can have all the karma calling you ever want. If God said that, would you believe him? Huh? Sounds good. I love that stuff. Fresh, steaming. The whole air is going to smell like caramel corn. Woo! What would you do if God says, I got to take a few with you, some of your family, your sons and their wives. I'm going to make it rain. Now, you go tell them, I'm not going to speak to them because you are my oracle. You are my mouthpiece. You're the one that's going to tell the world. You go tell the whole world that it's going to rain and flood and the earth is going to burst open and water's going to come bubbling up out of the earth and they're all going to drown if they don't get on this boat that you're building. See, I, I got to do a little bit of get your mind to think, what do you think, no, build a boat? I'm... Hey, uh, if God said to people in Colorado that the earth is going to end by snow and he should great, build a great snow boat to get out of it, I got a feeling they'd start building. Because they're seeing snow, amen? But there ain't been no rain. There ain't been no floods. Hadn't been none of that stuff. Everything had been just beautiful. We tell people, you know, Jesus is coming. They're going to be coming into this age. Jesus is coming. He's going to establish a kingdom upon this earth. Everything's going to change. Church is going to be caught out. They say, oh, it's just the same today as it was yesterday. That's what them guys said to Noah. Eh? He ain't changed none. Oh, no, you're nuts. He had to really hear from God, Amen. 
I mean, he was hearing from God, and he was listening to God. He was listening to God, and he went out and started to build a boat. Now, he went out and started to build this boat, and apparently he must have contacted, you know, got his sons to help and their wives. Go out and build this boat. And he worked on it for over 100 years. Sometimes I feel like what God called me to do in this church, he called me out 16, 18 years, about 18 years ago, he called me out and told to build a, a Jesus named Pentecostal church in this area and that there wasn't nothing like that here. He says, go out and build it and I'm going to fill it up. And sometimes I feel like Noah, that it's been 100 years. We're in the 14th year. We've been preaching this truth, and the longer we hear, the more truth is revealed, and the more truth we preach, the less people want to hear it. Poor old Noah, a hundred years, and nobody's listening to him. He's saying, the floods are coming. The floods are coming. We do the same thing. We keep hollering. The floods are coming. You're all going to drown. You're all going to nip to hell. Jesus is coming. You're all going to split hell wide open. Tell you about hell is love. We discovered that in Sunday school this morning, didn't we? Why do you think God's going to bring all these things upon the earth? Why do you think he's starting to stir things up upon this earth right now where the weather patterns are just crazy and everything's crazy and the volcanoes are crazy and everything is crazy? And, and they say, Yellowstone, did you know if Yellowstone blows, we'll, use a, we'll lose a quarter of the United States in one hour? Hmm. And the scientists say it's about 6,000 years overdue to blow. <laughs> Clear over somewhere in Nebraska will be gone. It's the largest volcano on earth. That whole thing just one great big volcano. Nebraska? Yellowstone. If it reaches clear, it'll, it'll blow away half of Nebraska. And then you, nothing will grow for years once it blows. Because the sky will be darkened, such it says. We can preach doom and gloom all we want. Everybody says, oh, it's the same today. It was yet today. you just doom and gloom. You're just preaching that, you know. No, you're preaching love. Not this kind of love that's being preached from the pulpit today that says, God loves everyone and he understands your sin. And, and so he knows that you're a sinner. I, I don't even have to tell the people that they sin. He said, the devil says, I don't have to tell the people. They already know that, you know. They just need to, they just need to think positive. I'm positive. And most of the people who listen to that message and swallow it are going to hell. Sometimes God works in strange and mysterious ways with people that, that haven't been taught nothing and they're not guided properly and he will draw them out and make them into something just by his own word. Or the, you, know, you know how I got saved? Committed to God? Because God called me out. Linda's got a whole supply of them, so if you ask for some, she'll give you them. Nobody put a gospel track in my hand. Nobody knocked on my door and said, would you like to come to my church and meet Jesus? Nobody witnessed to me on, my, on the street. Nobody. Nobody told me how to get saved in the church I was going to when I was young. Nobody. Nobody told me the truth. Nobody. But I had a curiosity for God. The only one that ever invited me to church was my mother, and I go just to shut her up once in a while. And that's the truth. And when I got there, they didn't have, there was no power, there was no, it was just church. 
but God has his hand on my life. And he supernaturally reached down and started teaching me and convicting me and caused me to want to read the Bible until I read it and I read it and I read it until I finally got it. What a shame that nobody bugged me. I'm challenging you all today. You need to bother somebody. Oh, they might not like me. They don't like you anyway. <laughs> if you're truly one of the called, elect, chosen, and ordained of God, they, and they're not... And they're not right with it. They don't like you. They just don't like the way you look. They don't like the way you talk. They don't like the way you smell. There's some, you ever notice that somebody just don't like you? I walk in the room and people just don't like me. They just don't like me. I never said nothing to them. I never did nothing to them. They don't even know who I am. You want me? <laughs> But the anointing that God has put on me just radiates off onto them and they know and conviction comes Hallelujah. without saying a word. So you might as well just say something because they don't like you anyway. Amen. And get the doggone blood off of your head and put it on theirs. Noah was doing exactly the same thing that God told Ezekiel, that the blood would be on his head if he didn't tell him. So for a hundred year, over a hundred years, he told him every day, he's out there hammering away, building that boat, building that boat. Everybody says his nuts. I come out here, went and told the city council, I wanted to build a Pentecostal church in Oxford. They said, oh, no, you don't. You're nuts. <laughs> one council member said, if you want to go to church here, there's two churches here, just go to one of them. So I continued to be nuts. Start up a church in the house. Give you a little history of this thing. How you are called, chosen, elect, ordained, and you are privileged to sit here this morning. So I started in, in the old camera shop. I started church in the old camera shop. I got up to about 30 people. Got to where it didn't hold them, so I put a tent right where the, where the Sunday school room and eating room is. Put a big old tent up there having church. And we was having church. We had 40, 50, 60 people coming in six months. God calls you to do something, you do it. God tells you to be in this church, you better be here. God tells you to be in service, you better be there. God tells you, you better do it. God tells you you're hearing truth, you better stay in the truth. Amen. Not go off to some lukewarm. Jesus said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, amen? amen. The cold ones might warm up, and the lukewarm ones are just going to stay there. I'm okay. I'm okay, I'm okay. I don't give a clue to y'all. You ain't okay. Without Jesus, you ain't okay. The only goodness in you comes from God. The indwelling of that Holy Spirit working inside of you. Otherwise, oh, people might act nice. They might do nice things. But they're not doing it for God. They're doing it for themselves. Some of the nicest people you ever met are going to end up in a place where the rich man was, amen? Because yeah. I, as I taught this morning in Sunday school, the rich man lived scrumptiously, had all the good things here, and what it really means is he did it his way. Whatever he felt like doing, he did. Muslims say their religion is submission. <laughs> true submission is true Christianity. Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will Flee. Submit to God. Well, how are you going to know what God wants? The book. Build a boat. It's going to rain. You ain't never seen rain. Hallelujah. It's a preaching of the gospel that brings people into the kingdom.
which is love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness. I forgot one. Righteous. Love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Without Jesus, there is no righteousness. You get in him and you can get righteous. That means you stand right before God. You can stand right before God and feel justified because you are in him. Otherwise, you're going to stand right before God and the fire of his mouth will come out and just devour you. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth, destroy all flesh, where is the breath of life under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee, but I will establish with thee, I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come unto the ark, and not only thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives, and with thee an agreement. Now, we're always talking about the old covenant and the new covenant, the old agreement and new agreement, but there was a few more agreements than just two. This is the agreement with Noah. God made a deal with him because he showed faith and he answered the call in the election. And he said, from your descendants, I will fill the earth. He made a covenant with Noah. Because Noah did what God asked him to do. Amen. Amen. He built the ark. And he did exactly what God told him. And he did it for a hundred years, despite the opposition, about all, despite all the naysayers. Everybody that was around him was a naysayer, saying, nay, it shall not happen. It can't be done. This thing ain't coming anyway. Well, can't you see that it's the same today as it was yesterday? The sun came up. In the east, and it's set in the west. Amen? Amen. Ain't no different. Ain't no different. My, my. Ain't no difference. The naysayers. God's not doing anything today. Come to the realization that God is absolutely sovereign. Everything that gets done, God's doing. And every living thing in the flesh, two of every sort, shall I bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Of the fowls after their kind, the cattle after their kind, every creeping thing on the earth after his kind, two of every sort, you shall come into thee to keep them. And take unto thee all food is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to there, and that shall be food for thee and for them. Thus Noah did according to all God commanded him. So he did. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come unto thee all those house of the ark for thee that I have righteous before me in this generation. For every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male, and the, the male and the female. The clean animals, everybody said, no, you know, you're a little Noah's Ark thing and everything is always two by two. But of the clean animals, he took 14 of each. Of the clean animals, he took 14, two males, or male and female of each. That would be animals that according to the Bible were clean to eat. 
God must have told Noah about it because he wasn't allowed to eat meat at all. Oh, I'd like to hear the conversations that Noah had with God. All the things he was revealing, thing, what he was doing with him. It must have been phenomenal. Amen. Must have been phenomenal. God talking to Noah, Noah talking to God, telling him all this stuff, laying down all this, all this wisdom and all these things, you know, that he might do what he ought to do in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Isn't that something? Clean animals. How many even knows what a clean animal is? Raise your hand. John does. Now, there were certain things that the Hebrew people weren't supposed to eat. Now it's, we're not under that law any longer, but there, you could only eat those who chew the cud, for mostly. I mean, cows and sheep and goats, and you could eat them, deer. No pigs, only fish with scales. No catfish, no shrimp, no scallops, all that stuff. For they were a chosen people. And actually, the diet's better. I mean, I eat some of that stuff, but you just don't want to eat a lot of that stuff because it's not good for you. And that's something that science finds out. Uh, it's not good for you. The naysayers are going to say, how do you know this really happened? How do you know this? The Bible says so, amen? And no one forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him and every beast, every creeping thing and every fowl, whatever was crept upon the earth, after the kind went forth unto the ark. And Noah built the ark unto the Lord and took it, every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered him burnt offering. He had to have clean beast and clean fowls for offerings unto God. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake from the Imagination of man heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. That's a covenant with Noah. A covenant with Noah. Preachers mistakenly preached that the world is coming to an end. He says, it's not coming to an end. Where they read that, it's the end of the age. It's the end of man's reign upon the earth. God made an ark to bring forth life in the generations of Noah. God brought Jesus as the ark that you might get into to bring you forth from this tribulation, this trial that has come upon this whole earth. To deliver you from a time of eternity separated from God in torment. To a time of eternity in fellowship with the living God. Let me tell you this morning. The trouble with hell is you can't go there for a weekend to see how you like it. There ain't no airplanes flying down there with a weekend in hell. Have, you know, you can't go down there and they try and sell you a piece of the property and give you a free trip to hell for two nights and three days in beautiful hell. See if you want to buy a piece of it. The devil 
will try and tell you that. How many ever went one of those things? I had a heck of a time getting my money back, going to Branson, Missouri, two days and three nights in beautiful Branson. When I got there, they said I didn't make enough money to get my free. I told them I could buy this place if I wanted to, but I don't want to. I just want my free room. <laughs> Trying to sell me a timeshare. There ain't no timeshares in hell. You can't go there just once a year to try it out. Once you're there, you're there. You don't like it, you're stuck. And I got a guarantee for you, you ain't gonna like it. You ain't gonna like it. There ain't no fried chicken there. No sweet potato pie. None of that good stuff. Amen. Huh. But you have the opportunity to get on the boat just like Noah did. Get on the boat, Jesus, and go across the waters and make a covenant with him. That I might put on righteousness of Jesus Christ. Repent. Acts 3.19. Repent and be converted that the times of refreshing might come. Until I came to a true conversion experience. I feared hell. I've read the Bible then more than most of y'all probably ever going to read. It. Still wasn't saved. I was so religious that it was ridiculous, and you know I never could do it. I could argue Bible with any preacher I run into and make a fool of him. And that's the truth in the mother. Just make a fool of him because he didn't know his stuff. They had not got into the Word and know their stuff. If somebody had, he would have told me how to get saved. All I do is back him into a corner and they just corner. Repent. But when that day came, and the Holy Spirit came and it pierced me in the heart. Such as it did in Acts 2:36. They heard the gospel, and God revealed his truth to me, and I was pierced in the heart. I didn't wonder anymore if my eternal destiny was in the wrong place. I knew that it was. I knew that all my religion, all my Bible reading, all my Bible arguing, all my date-keeping and diet-keeping and all the stuff I was keeping weren't going to keep me. Weren't going to keep me. I come to a realization that I needed Jesus. I didn't need to know about him. Uh uh. I didn't need to know what some preacher told me about him. I didn't need to know what syst some systematic theology told me about him. I needed to know the Jesus that I found inside the pages of that book. Who revealed himself to me by his word and told me what I must do. And I said, okay, Lord. Oh, boy, watch out. 
I said, okay, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I give up. I'll do it. His word said to repent, change your mind, be baptized in his name. I found a fellow believer to take me to the creek, dump me in the water, so doggone fast. It was so cold and muddy. That's what he said to do, so I did it. And he said, study my word to show thyself approved. And I started to study it with an enlightening of the Holy Spirit. And then Acts 2.39 came to light. It says, repent, be baptized, everyone, in the name of the Lord Jesus. You shall receive, you shall receive, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And during my religious time, I didn't know, again, couldn't get a clue of what the Holy Spirit was. The Bible talked to me about receiving the Holy Ghost and speaking in other tongues and a heavenly language and, and the power of God coming on me and it was just like scrambled eggs. I, 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 the words just moved around on the page. It didn't make no sense. But all of a sudden, once I walked in submission to God, the power of the living God came upon me, baptized me in the Holy Ghost and fire, to do what he wanted done which I had known in the back of my mind for a long time that he wanted done but I didn't want to do it oh there was a time that the devil came to me I was comfortable I was baptized in the Holy Ghost in fire I was in leadership in a church I wasn't the pastor. I was a deacon. I hope I wasn't a demon like most of them are. That was part of my training. God sent me on. He sent me on to be trained. Sat under a pastor, learned something. Don't go off half cock. Think you're going to do something. You get yourself prepared, right? Get that thing with God telling you to do something. You get into that thing and you get into it so deep that you'll understand it from one end to the other. Study to show thyself approved. Because if you go off half cock, you're going to end up just being a flash in the pan. That's a, that's a bunch of muzzle loading dog. Flash in the pan is all you do go poop, but you don't go off. You walk in the knowledge and the truth of the living God. Not only you be saved from an eternal lake of fire, but you'll live in this life feeling called, elect, ordained, chosen. You'll have purpose. You, you talk to the unsaved person. And this is just, what? why am I here? What am I doing? What's it all about? Without that conversion and spirit, you don't understand what this is all about. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe there's somebody here this morning that needs to walk into that true conversion experience. repent be converted change your mind if anybody's mind needs changing and going toward Jesus this morning I want to see your hand hit the air just like a, like a spear there's one anybody else anybody else hallelujah everybody can raise your head go ahead and raise your heads up I see that hand can you take another step? Can you take a step and come up here? If you're a Christian, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you expect to go into the kingdom, what kind of essence are you admitting? 
Are you a half-hearted Christian and you go to church once in a while and go here and there once in a while and go to a special meeting or something but just don't seem to want to get hooked up with the church and serve God? The church is the body of Christ and you should be in one of those bodies that you might do the effective work of God. If that's you, you should either come to Anchored in Faith Gospel Church or get to a similar-minded church that can give you a community of love to be in and that you might serve Christ and be truly the essence of Christ. If you are not part of the body of Christ, you need to take on the essence of Christ. Lay aside your old self and put him on new. And let your life be changed. Then get hooked up with the church. Let's pray. Lord God, for those who are half-hearted, we ask you that they will turn their hearts fully to you, Lord, and become an instrument for God, work inside a church. For those that aren't saved, Lord, we pray that they accept Christ. If you haven't accepted Christ, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, forgive my sin. Enter into my life. May I take on your attributes and your ways and cast mine away. Amen. If you said that prayer and you meant it, then you've started a walk with Christ. You need to continue that walk and get into church and be surrounded by like-minded believers. We love you at Anchored in Faith. In addition to our postal address, Anchored in Faith Gospel Church has several electronic means to connect with you. Find our TV episodes at youtube.com slash anchored in faith. Visit our website at anchoredinfaith.org. Our phone number, which is area code 319-828-4815. Our email is tv at anchoredinfaith.org. And find us on Facebook by typing at AIFGC into the Facebook search box. We are actually a small church. If you call our 828-4815 phone number, leave a short message and make sure to include your phone number so we can call you back since we do not have caller ID. Full sermons are available anytime at www.anchoredinfaith.org. Contact us by calling 319-828-4815 or write us at Anchored in Faith, PO Box 204, Oxford, Iowa, 52322 or email us at tv at anchoredinfaith.org. This has been a copyrighted presentation of Anchored in Faith Gospel Church, Oxford, Iowa. The latest release of our full-length cable TV telecasts are now prominently posted each week, beginning Sunday evenings on YouTube, youtube.com slash anchored in faith. Search for anchored in faith, all one word, in the search box for smart TVs and Roku TV viewing.